everyone, I'm Laurel Griffith. Welcome to Sunday School. I'm so happy to be with you today. Today our lesson is uh, for December, Sunday, December the 17th. It is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And we will be talking about the family of God. But before we begin with our focal passage, let me give you just a little bit of context about the book of Matthew. Matthew uh, is the second gospel to be written. Mark was the first, and Mark was written about A.D. 70. And this is a, an important date uh, for us to know and to remember um, in terms of being able to look at Scripture and to, to date it and relate it to the events that were going on at that particular time. For you probably remember that from A.D. 68 through 70 that uh Rome and the Jews in Jerusalem had a war and uh, Rome dominated the Jerusalem. Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed and the Jews who survived uh, uh, so were scattered. And so AD 70 is the date um, that scholars uh, date the fall of Jerusalem. Mark was written about that time in the Gospel of Matthew, which has uh, takes a lot of its content from the book of Mark came to, uh, into being probably 10 to 20 years later. So scholars date this anywhere from AD 80 to AD 90. Now, the reason this is significant is because of the audience that is going to receive this work. If you uh, think about this, these are Jewish Christians primarily who have uh, fled Rome and are living scattered uh, around. There is no temple any longer. The temple has been destroyed. So no longer is the temple the center of Jewish life and faith. But now instead, it, there is a rise of the significance of the synagogues. This is where the religious life of the average Jewish person would take place. And the Christians who were Jews first and who have converted to Christianity are now in this time and period, they've, they've, uh, tried to um, be a part of the synagogues for, for several decades or for years. And now it, the, the division, the break is uh, becoming more formalized and they are being um, kicked out of the synagogue. And so they are without their, what they conceived or, or thought of as their family of faith. They have been uh, set free or divorced uh, in a way from their family of faith. And so they feel that sense of isolation and that sense of, of wondering about this loss of identity that they have. They are also in a world that's hostile to them, for they are living in the world of Rome. Rome uh, dominates everything, and Rome rules through local kings that uh, have the power that Rome invests in them. And so these Christians are not always persecuted, but there's always the threat of persecution. So they have this this questioning of their identity and of their place in the world and this struggle to remain faithful in the middle of the events that swirl around them. So Matthew writes his, his gospel into this particular time in history, and he's writing about historical events um, in the life of Jesus. Uh, and he is, but he's writing uh, with the with an idea of of building a theology, so that people have an understanding that what do these events mean? How do these events that have occurred that are true, the these eyewitness accounts of those who were with Jesus, what does that mean to them, and how will it shape the way they live and move in the world uh, to come? So that is the that is sort of the the context of this this book, this gospel, and it is um, begins with a verse that sets the tone, not just for the verses that follow in this first chapter, but also for the whole book. So let's read verse one, Matthew one, verse one, and talk about this for just a moment. An account of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So this is, Matthew is giving us his title uh, here of, of his gospel, that this is an account of the genealogy. Um, the the um, direct translation would say, this is the book of the beginning. And it's that word Genesis 
So it is the same word that is used when we go back to the first book in the Old Testament, where we have called it the beginning, the beginning of God's creation, the beginning of what happened when God created heavens and earth and breathed life into to man and woman. So now what we have is with this account of Jesus Christ, we are at a new beginning. We are at the beginning of the new creation. And this is the account that Matthew is going to give us of what it is to know that we have this new identity uh, that is found in Jesus Christ. So Matthew calls Jesus the Messiah, and we know that this Messiah, the word Messiah uh, comes from a word, is translated Messiah in the Hebrew. It means anointed one. You would also see in Greek that when you see Jesus Christ, Christ is the same word. So Christ means anointed one, Christ and Messiah are translations of the same word. So the anointed one, when you think back in the life of the of the Jewish people, it was kings and priests who were anointed. And so here we see that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, and in you would connect in your mind that Jesus is a king and a priest. And so we're going to find out uh, what that looks like as Jesus moves through this gospel account. We're going to see what it means for Jesus to be king of the world. What does it mean for Jesus to be our great high priest? He is the son of David and the son of Abraham. So these are strategic titles that Matthew has chosen to include here in this first verse as he introduces his gospel. So let's start with the son of Abraham. The son of Abraham means that Jesus is the one who is heir to all the promises of Abraham. Jesus is the one who fulfills the covenant that God made with Abraham and receives the promises of Abraham. And right off the bat, what we are understanding here is who Abraham is. Abraham was a Gentile who was called by God and received the covenant from God. And then God separated him out from the rest of the Gentiles to form a people who would become a family of Abraham and the nation of Israel. But the origins of Abraham were in the Gentile world. And when God establishes this covenant with Abraham, it, you can read about this in Genesis 12, verses one through three, where God says, I am going to bless you, I am going to be with you, and I am going to make you a great nation. And from you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. Well, we know from that point going forward that Israel was formed into a nation, but Israel struggled to fulfill the covenant that God established with Abraham and then ultimately with them through Moses. Israel failed. Israel uh, uh, would, would uh, struggle with idolatry. And Israel never did achieve this potential or, or they were never loyal to the call that God had placed upon them. But here we have Jesus, Jesus who has been anointed. Jesus is coming into the world and he is Abraham's son. And Jesus is the one who will ultimately fulfill what the Jewish people were unable to do. Jesus, Jesus will be the one who is the light to the nations. Jesus is the one through whom all the people of the world will be blessed. So right here from the very first verse in the Gospel of Matthew, what we see is that God's plan of salvation and redemption that began all the way back with Abraham it continues and climaxes in Jesus Christ. It is inclusive. He has chosen the Jewish people, but he's chosen the Jewish people to shine his light to the world so that all the world will come to God, come to worship the one true God. And in Jesus Christ, we see this fulfilled and lived out. So the gospel is inclusive of all people, um, no matter their backgrounds, no matter their sin, no matter how unlikely they look uh, to, to the people around them. God loves them and God is including them in his great plan of redemption. So we also see in this first verse <clears throat> that Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one, is the son of David. So we want to understand this a little bit more as well. Uh, this is Matthew's favorite title for Jesus, son of David. He uses it 10 times in his gospel. And this is the idea that Jesus fulfills the Davidic covenant that God established 
with King David. And our lesson last week um, gave us a little foreshadowing of, of what was coming when Jesus, when David, the shepherd boy, in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel was anointed king. And then when he faced Goliath, which is our focal passage last Sunday, and we saw that David was uh, in fact becoming the king that he had been anointed to be. And he would be the one who in that moment delivered Israel from the enemy, from Goliath and the Philistines that were surrounding them. But yet we know that David had all this promise and all this potential, and God had made this covenant with him, but David failed. David had the great sin in his life with Bathsheba, and David uh, was not someone who was able to, uh, he had a heart after after God. He was, he was God's man, but David struggled himself with sin. And we see that after David um, was, uh, after David passed away, that his, his son Solomon struggled, and from there on, the kingdom just fell apart and there was division in the kingdom and Israel struggled for, for the next generations to follow and worship God alone. Idolatry was a problem and they disobeyed God and ultimately they, were, they ended up in exile. They were taken away into Babylon. And so when they were taken away into Babylon, that was the last time one of David's sons was on his throne. So at that moment, what you have is the death of a dream for Israel, the, the heartbreaking reality that this idea that, that David's throne would be uh, sustained was now no longer. The Jews are in exile and they are there mourning their sin and recognizing their failure. And when they come back out of exile, they come back into a Jerusalem that has been shattered and things are just not the same. And, and eventually they end up under the domination of Rome. And this word Messiah that uh, we would read as Christ or Messiah or God's anointed one, this period in Jewish history becomes a, a word that represents deliverance to the Jewish people and a return to the way things used to be, a rescue from the darkness, a rescue from the domination of other powers, a rescue from Rome. And so here what we see in this very first sentence that Matthew is setting uh, Jesus up here and showing that Jesus is going to be the son of David, the one who does assume the throne, the one who rules and reigns eternally. And he is the one who is going to be the one who ultimately rescues men and women from the darkness of sin and death and the grave. And all of this, of course, was pointed, foreshadowed by David, the shepherd boy uh, that we saw last week. So this first verse in the first chapter of Matthew is packed with meaning. And then we move from verses two through 17 and Matthew moves into the genealogy of Jesus and what this looks like. Now, if I'm going to be honest with you, genealogy has always felt a little uh, dull to me, hard to understand why uh, it was important and significant to take a look at all of these names. And that's out of my own ignorance and lack of understanding what the gospel writer is trying to do. So perhaps you have felt that way in the past too, and hopefully this lesson will correct some of those assumptions. And so here what we find is that Matthew is attempting not to just give us a biological or genetic record, but rather he is building a theology uh, for us to understand, for his readers to understand. Matthew chooses the people that he includes in this genealogy. He leaves some out. He, uh, he arranges the names according to his preference. And that is not because Matthew is trying to play loose with the facts, but rather genealogies in the ancient world were not just records of family records. It's not like you open your family Bible and you looked at all the people that were in your mama's, uh, in your mama's history or connected to your, to your family history, but rather genealogy frequent, frequently was used to build theological understanding. And you can find that in other places in the Bible. So that is what Matthew is doing here. So we make a mistake when we try to use this genealogy to, um, to prove uh, anything uh, biological or genetic. 
Rather, we need to do the work to look and see what are the theological implications of the genealogy for the people of that day and also for us as well. So now let's let's read uh, verses 2 through 17 and, and take a look at what Matthew has included. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Aram, and Aram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David. And David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, and Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Salathiel, Salathiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiod, and Abiod the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Achim, and Achim the father of Eliad, and Eliad the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. You could do an in-depth investigation and look at all of these, but you may, we don't have time for that in this video, but you may recognize uh, that there's some interesting things going on in these names that Matthew has chosen to include. First of all, the thing that jumps out at us is we see that there are women that are included in this genealogy, which is highly unusual in a genealogy that's coming from uh, the father or the, the males of the family. Uh, women just would not have been included. And not only are there women, these women included, but each of these women, there are five included, the four prior to Mary uh, that are included are either Gentiles or they are some kind of outcast, or they are connected to some kind of sexual sin. So these would be, have been the people that would have been the least likely uh, to be included in the kingdom of God. These are the people that would have been overlooked, rejected, and considered to have been without value. You've got Tamar, you've got Rahab, you've got the wife of Uzziah, which we know to be Bathsheba. And you've got Ruth, and Ruth was the Moabitess. If you remember, we did uh, studied her a couple of weeks ago. So here you have this list of women who would have been so unlikely to have been included in this new family that Matthew is announcing that is coming through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, God's anointed one, who is coming as the one to fulfill the promises that God has made to his people and also coming to rule and reign on David's throne and to bring with him that rescue, that salvation that the Jewish people anticipated and longed for and prayed for. But here these unlikely people are a part of this lineage. Not only is it women, but it's also this list is filled with sinners, people who abandoned their role uh, in, in what God had called them to do, kings who, uh, who strayed and worshipped idols. Um, it, is, it is filled with people who are uh, unimportant in the world around them. The, the second son, instead of the first son, the second son shows up several times which would have been the person who was less likely than the first son to be seen as significant in the life of a family. So the genealogy of Jesus, the point here, is the genealogy here of Jesus 
the, the new family, the account of the beginning of the family formed by Jesus Christ is an unlikely mix of people. It's people that don't fit the preconceived idea of who gets in or who belongs, but it is by God's grace that all are included and all are invited to participate in this new kingdom that Jesus Christ is going to uh, proclaim and to, uh, to teach about and to usher in with his life, his ministry, his, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. All of that is a part of what is going on here in these first 17 verses. Now, there is also this interesting thing that there's 14 generations um, that, that Matthew has divided these names into uh, groups of 14, three groups of 14. And so this, uh, upon first reading, seems just, uh, just an organizational tool to us, perhaps. But in fact, what Matthew is doing is driving home the point that this uh, is connected to King David. So you are probably familiar with it that in the Hebrew alphabet, that letters also were equated to numbers. And so the word David or the name David, when you give a sign the, the Hebrew letters, the numbers that are associated with the Hebrew letters, you find the number 14. So Matthew has uh, arranged this content and then stated it explicitly that the number 14 is significant here. And the Jewish reader would have recognized that this was the, the number that represented King David. So here we see that not only is Matthew proclaiming it explicitly, he is also filling this, uh, this uh, this list with these references that we should not miss, that this is the, the Jesus is the one who is the king, the son of David, who will rune, rule and reign eternally. Jesus is the one who is ushering in a new family, a family of faith that is connected to God through him, through his life, his death, and his resurrection. We are invited to be a part of this family of God. And so um, Matthew is celebrating this even as he introduces the gospel. So if we go to the end of the book of Matthew, and this is not in your, your uh, quarterly, your lesson quarterly, but I think it's significant and perhaps it, it is, is good for us to remind ourselves. When we go to the very um, end of the gospel of Matthew, the last chapter and the last few verses, verses 18 through 20, I'll read those now. This is, of course, is after the death and the resurrection of Jesus and prior to the ascension, the last thing that Jesus that Matthew records that Jesus shares with his disciples. And he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So here, Jesus is giving the explicit command to his followers to go and to make disciples, to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they are to go into all the nations. So Matthew begins with this, uh, this description showing us that the gospel is for all people. And he ends his gospel by saying, not only is the gospel for all people, but you are called to share and to take forth the message of hope, the message of salvation, to all people, to share your faith story with others so that they may come to know Jesus Christ. So in closing today, because of the season of the year where we find ourselves with this particular lesson, I thought this might be a good question for you guys to consider in your discussion. Many of us will gather during this season with our extended families uh, around the dinner table. Uh, we may uh, swap Christmas presents or we may, we may have a time where we share and I would encourage you to think about how you can share your faith story of being a part of the family of faith with your biological family. You know, perhaps that is the greatest 
place for you to share the good news of Jesus Christ is to make sure that your children and your grandchildren hear your testimony. And what a great time to do that during this Advent season and as we move into Christmas, as we celebrate the arrival of Jesus Christ, we also look forward to his return. And what is your testimony? What is your story? How are you connected to the family of faith through Jesus Christ. And wouldn't you take a few moments to think about that and then to plan to share it when you gather during this season. Well, God bless you all. I have enjoyed being with you today and I look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Have a great week.